Hello, everyone. I would like to introduce you to our next invited speaker, Sandy Maguire. Most of you probably know Sandy through his library, Polysemi. I know him through his books on thinking with types and algebra-driven design, both of which I really enjoyed reading. He will talk to us today about something a bit different, so tactic metaprogramming in Haskell. Uh, I think I've seen some related comments, commits from him in the RAS Haskell Lo language server repo this morning. So I guess this is really fresh stuff. I'm really grateful to Sandy for accepting our invitation to speak at ZuriHack 2020. Take it away, Sandy. Hi, ZuriHack. Thank you so much, Farhad and, um, and Jasper and everybody organizing this. Um, ZuriHack is one of my favorite events. Uh, I attended in person a few years ago, and it was just such a delight. Uh, unfortunately, it's um, I haven't gotten really a chance to hack this this week, um, but that's okay. You know, maybe next year. Um, so I, I'm just so sort of honored to be here and humbled by sort of the presence I'm in of so many fantastic humans in just one place and also in one community. Um, the Haskell community is, is just such a, an amazing place to be. So thank you all for your part in that. Um, today, uh, so my name is Sandy McGuire, and today I want to talk about um, a project I've been working on called Wingman. And um, Wingman is sort of my approach to make programming less terrible. Um, and I, I realize that's quite a, a charged claim, and hopefully I'll back it up a little bit. Um, this talk comes in sort of three parts. One is sort of the philosophy of why I think things need to change and how that could be different. And that's sort of just to motivate you so that um, maybe you'll be in the same headspace as I'm in. Um, the second part is to sort of explore what Wingman is um, in sort of the discoverability mode. And so sort of what are the things it can do for you today that will make your job easier, um, but don't really require sort of a mental shift. Um, and then finally, the, the third part is to talk about um, sort of what tactic metaprogramming is and how that can sort of really change the way you approach programming. And so that's sort of where the um, maybe the clickbaity title comes from, right? A, a new kind of programming. So um, those are the three big things. Um, before I dive in, though, there's just a few acknowledgments I need to do. Um, Wingman is a plugin, a plugin for the Haskell language server, and so none of these things I'm doing today could, are, are possible without uh, all the hard work of everybody involved in the Haskell language server. So thank you all so much for that. Um, I, I tried a few years ago, and I just I, I made no progress because I was continuously fighting with sort of getting GHC into interactive mode. Mm -hmm. And the other person I really want to thank is Reed Milanix, or Tot Woof, as his name is online, um, who is responsible for a fantastic library called Refinery that um, is sort of the underpinning of all my work here. And then also sort of for his spiritual leadership um, on this, where just so many nights I contacted Reed and said, like, hey, how should my program work? Or sort of what should I do in this case? And he was always down to, to have good ideas and to, to help me through it. So thank you to, to everyone involved. And without further ado, let's talk about um, why coding sucks. And I mean, there's tons of there's tons of reasons, right? And everyone can sort of choose their own reasons for why it's terrible. Um, I've got two in particular that I find are, are extremely relevant here. Um, oh, and just apologies, there's no slides for this talk. I put a slide deck together and I realized Nobody really cares, right? Nobody wants to see slides of a new kind of program. They just want to see the new kind of programming. So uh, when we dive in, we'll just go and we'll see. And hopefully, the demo gods will be friendly, and we'll see from there. But um, so so anyway, the, there's two sort of main problems I see with with programming in Haskell today. Um, and one is that there's sort of this fundamental tension between working at a high level um, and also sort of at the lower level of sort of syntactically doing it, of like writing the code we want to write. And so you sort of have to stay at this high level of abstraction of keeping your eye on the goal and saying, you know, what am I trying to accomplish and what does accomplishment look like? And sort of how will I get there strategically, right? And then on the, on the lower level, sort of there's the syntactic concerns and it's sort of being familiar with the language and the grammar and the idioms in order to articulate yourself, right? So, um, so the low level stuff is sort of the grammar and the rules and the high level stuff is sort of the poetry and like the beautiful things that you like to articulate. Um, and my claim is that these are intention, right? Because every time you sort of need to switch from the high level to the low level, it's a context shift. And there's the, the possibility that maybe we'll forget, right? And, or we'll like, um, you just sort of lose a little bit of context. And every time you lose context, I'm sure I don't have to tell anyone like how much work it is to sort of get back into the right headspace of being in problem solving mode. Um, I find this often with uh, with my partner where um, it, it's fantastic to live with her because I will sort of 
be down a rabbit hole five hours deep where she'll come and say, what are you working on? And I realized like, I didn't know what I was working on, right? I, I lost track of what I was trying to accomplish. And I was just solving bug after bug in sort of this tower, like this maybe tunnel of, uh, of implementation details, right? Without really any idea of what I was working on. So, um, so I don't think this is a fundamental flaw, right? And when we talk about uh, pair programming, sort of that's, a, that's a, a nice solution to this. And if you're unfamiliar with pair programming, the idea is you get two humans together and they're both programmers, you sit them beside each other. And one is sort of the driver who's responsible for, for typing code and turning ideas into code, right? And they're sort of, they can sort of stay focused on the low level um, like linguistic abilities. And then their partner is in more of a navigating role. And um, if they have a computer, they're not using it to code, they're using it to like look at documentation and sketch diagrams and sort of keep track of what's the goal. And so by communicating between the two, they can communicate at a at sort of a mid-level of abstraction. And so it's not too far for either party, right? Um, and so my claim is that because there's sort of fewer context shifts, more work gets done, even though you're putting two people on doing one, one task, right? It, it seems to me like it's sort of more than two times uh, efficient. Um, Unfortunately, we don't all have uh, pair programming partners, right? Or in, in, a, in an industry setting, maybe there's just no one we can work with and uh, or on your own back for that, for that case, right? Um, and so, so Wingman to me is sort of putting humans back in the navigator spot, right? Where trying to, to, to empower them to say, well, here's what I want to articulate and I'm gonna let the computer put in the details. And I'll show you a lot of examples of what that looks like in a minute. Um, but there's sort of one other reason that writing code sucks, and it's it's sort of inefficient in a different way. And the way I like to think about this is, let's say you're writing a Haskell expression, right? And so at any given sort of point in time, there's only really three or four things you might want to do, right? You might want to use uh, some term that is in scope, or you might want to call a function, or maybe you want to do a pattern match, or you sort of maybe want to do a let binding. And that's sort of everything there is in Haskell, right? Um, of course, the details of those are the, the challenging part. Um, but there's really not that many options at any given point in time. And so we can imagine maybe there's, what, 100 things in scope, maybe if it's a big module, right? And so, um, so maybe if we're generous, let's say there's 128 sort of options at any given point in time. There's sort of four fundamental options, and then there's sort of which function will I call or which actual value will I use, right? Um, and so if you if you think about 128 uh, options, that's seven bits of information, right? Sort of information theoretically. Um, and so sort of if I, if I were to take seven binary yes or no choices, I could pin down a single message um, out of the space of all possible actions I might want to do. And when you when you think about it like that, seven bits is really not very much, right? Because there's also about a hundred keys on the keyboard, um, which means there's also seven bits for sort of every time I need to write a character. And the inefficiency here comes from the fact that if um, in order to accomplish any of these like sort of fundamental tasks I'm trying to do in Haskell, it requires more than one keystroke, right? If I want to do a let binding, I need to write several uh, several characters even and so each one of those characters is like seven or eight bits depending on if you're ASCII or Unicode right or plus so I, I'm sort of doing more work than is strictly necessary and um, if we can uh, if we can turn on the the slides uh, we can love to go from there and um, I don't think I have the ability to do that oh they're on okay great so the slides are on and so for example, right, let's say I want to write the ID function. And this is sort of my bread and butter. Uh, I write this function so many times. And so I've sort of written the type here. And if you think about ID, there's, um, there's actually only one implementation, right? Once I've written down the type, there's zero more bits of information because um, there's only one implementation and log base two of zero of one is zero. So there's, there's no decision to be made here anymore. There's, <clears throat> excuse me, the implementation is, is entirely defined from the type. And so if I have a hole here, um, the implementation is sort of bind x and x. And there's a reason I'm using lambda syntax. And it's mostly just so I can sort of do a word count. So this is 10 bytes, right, of information. In order to articulate zero bytes of, <coughs> of code. Um, and so, like, why did I have to do that much work, right? Um, 
you might think about this another way. And so it's sort of the wingman approach is uh, at every step of the way, it sort of gives you actions. Um, which let you sort of build the next step. And so these are implemented as code actions in the Haskell language server. So all of this is sort of available today if you just install Haskell language server um, and you use a, a code action in Visual Studio code. Um, the code action is sort of the, the little light bulb that pops up when you get an underline. In Vim, I have to do some code bindings and sort of it's the Vim approach always. But um, so if I, uh, if I go like this, I can pull up my code actions. So I've written just a whole. Um, and sort of that's the, the paradigm that this is based around is sort of whole driven development. And it says, I can choose by number now, right? And I have four different options here, which sort of, again, that's only two bits of information, right? And um, there's a few of them, but in particular, what I'm interested in right now is introduce Lambda. So if I type two, um, what Wingman has done is it's gone and it looked at the type of my whole and it said, oh, the type of my whole is a Lambda. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to synthesize a Lambda term, and I'm going to come up with names for everything, right? So it picked a name here, X, and then it moved, uh, it shuffled this thing around just because it's sort of more idiomatic to put our variables on the left side of the equals rather than to introduce a Lambda. Um, and if I go back to my hole, oops, if I go back to my hole, um, oh, I have to save, I think. If I go back to my hole, um, now I still only have four options. And one of them is attempt to fill hole, right? Because you can sort of imagine I'm done now, right? There's no more work to do, to do. So I can just say attempt to fill hole and wingman will implement the function for me. This is the only thing sort of that will type check given what's in scope. Um, and so, so it's sort of written this program for me. And again, sort of introducing the Lambda was, was unnecessary. And I could have just done attempt to fill hole, right? Uh, type in number one from the hole and it Oh, well, actually, that's not a very good implementation. So that might be a bug there. Whoops. <laughs> um, so we'll just ignore that. Um, but I think it did used to work. I also pushed some code this morning that might have broken some things. So um, so let's, let's sort of move on. And there's this fantastic function called note from the errors package. And it takes an E and then a maybe A, and it produces an either E and A. Right? And the idea being here, you unpack the maybe. If it's a nothing, you have to give back the E. If it's uh, a just, then you give back the A. Um, and so if I were to write this by hand, sort of I need to bind E and then bind MA, and then say, well, OK, there's case MA of, and I have to sort of remember what these constructors are, and then go like this. And it's actually more beautiful if I put the nothing first. And then in the nothing case, uh, I could produce a left or a right. Right, but I, producing a right I know in advance will not work. Right, it's not actually going to give me what I want um, because I, I don't have an A in scope. And so, as a programmer, I could dive in there, but it's unlikely to sort of be fruitful. And intuition lets me know that. So instead, I need to produce a left here. And now, um, the only thing I can do is produce this E. Right, there, there's no other options. I don't have an E in scope from anywhere else, and it's a scolum, so I can't produce one in any other way. So it has to be E. In the, in the just case, I do have some wiggle room. I could produce a left E still, right? There's nothing stopping me from that. Uh, again, other than sort of intuition and knowledge that that's sort of a stupid choice. And the reason that's a stupid choice is because if I were to just produce left E, then this A is sort of unused. And then in that case, the entire maybe is unused. And so that's sort of suggesting that the type was a lie, right? Um, but when you're sort of writing code for people, you sort of trust the user to have told you the right thing. And so Wingman assumes that the user knows what they're doing and that they gave uh, this argument for a reason. And so instead, the, the implementation here is instead to be right. And then once you've implemented right, of course, the only option is to give back the A. So, so that's sort of how you would write this code by hand, right? Um, and now, so I guess actually before we do, let's sort of look at how many code. That's 93 characters of code, right? Times seven bits is what, 700 bits of sort of work I needed to do. Um, that's, that's crazy, right? In order, because again, there's sort of two implementations of this function and only one of them is reasonable. So in the best case, there's sort of two implementations and the actual case there's really only one implementation. And I still needed to expend sort of 700 bits of optimization pressure in order to write that function. So let's again approach this with women. So I put down a hole and I can ask, uh, uh, can ask for a um, code action and I'd say, uh, I'm going to use refine hole this time. And refine hole is like introduce lambda, except um, it's sort of a little cleverer. And refine hole will say, use the only data constructor I have where um, lambdas count as a data constructor. 
So sort of refine hole is strictly more useful than introduce lambda, uh, but a little less discoverable. So again, this is written code for me, and it's picked two variable names, right? It's picked E and it's picked MA, where MA is a maybe A, right? It's not the world's best name, but naming things is really hard, right? It's one of the two hardest program uh, problems in programming. And maybe more importantly, um, because we're in Haskell, we sort of don't have cache invalidation as an issue. And so it is the only hard problem, right, for us. Um, so I can go back to this hole, and now I can say, well, now I want a case split on MA, right? This is a new option. And you'll notice I actually have several more options here now. So Wingman is sort of contextually smart enough to say, what's the context in which I'm running and sort of what are meaningful actions to provide in that case. You'll also notice it's given me the option to, uh, to use data constructors. Of course, my implementation doesn't want a data constructor yet. So what I do want to do is case split on MA. So I type two and I hit enter. And um, what it does is you'll notice now it does a case split, right? What used to be one clause of MA is now two clauses, one for nothing and one for just. And so this is quite an idiomatic thing, right? Where now it's produced, uh, it, it, again, it picked a name A for this, for this variable. So not only is this writing code for me, it's also sort of alleviating the need for me to come up with names that don't really matter, right? The, I will admit um, the names it comes up with are not always beautiful, but that's the thing you can sort of solve afterwards, right? You can get the code writing written and then stylistically change it a little bit. But. So here, um, so again, I can sort of use constructor left and then use E, or I can just sort of uh, say attempt to fill a hole. And Wingman is, again, smart enough to just fill the hole for me. And likewise, I can do that here on the, the just case. And I do it, and it implements right A. But you'll also notice that it uh, it got rid of the E here, right? It, it replaced this E binding with a, with a wildcard. And the reason it can do that is because um, I've implemented the entire function. There's no more holes remaining. And so there's no more opportunity to use E. And then Wingman notices that it didn't use E. And therefore, uh, it just disappears, right? And by itself, this isn't a huge feature, right? But it probably saves five seconds. And it saves five seconds um, every time I do sort of a completion, right? Uh, and I, my claim is that this, this time adds up. Not only does it add up sort of um, in the clock sense, right, in terms of like how much time do I spend programming, but it also ends up, or it adds up in the time that I don't get distracted from my main goal. So um, so that's quite exciting, I find, right? Um, there's a, a few more things I might want to do, and we can delete this. So let's say I have some type foo, which takes a Boolean and produces maybe a string. I don't know, right? I'm just winging it. So again, I can sort of refine my hole. And um, so the there's always a code action that will case split on any term that exists. Um, but maybe I want to case split on sort of a function application here, right? And one thing I could do is sort of say, like, I let x equals show of b and then maybe pattern match on that. And then now I have a case split on X. But again, I had to do sort of some work that felt like that was more for the computer's case than or for the computer's sake than it was for mine. So instead, um, what I can do, Wingman lets me uh, write an empty case statement. And so I can say case B of. And you'll notice uh, on the right here, it says Wingman complete case constructors bool. And so this is a code lens. And um, it's sort of, if I, uh, if I type my button that runs code lenses, it will run that and it'll sort of synthesize this. But if I go back, I can say show B. And all of a sudden, this bool turns to a string now, right? And so now um, it's smart enough to say, well, OK, the types here are now a string. And so if I run that, it gives me the string constructors. So I mean, this is all like quite exciting, right? Um, but maybe it's not immediately clear to you how valuable this is, right? If I'm just saying, OK, left and right, like those are things I, that are so well ingrained into my brain that maybe it's not all that valuable to be able to automate. But here's a here's an interesting case, right? So let's say I have a size of HSX per GHCPS int. And you might be wondering, what the heck is an HSX per GHCPS? And that is uh, GHC's internal representation of a Haskell expression. So um, I just imported GHC there automatically. That's from the language server, not from Wingman. Um, but it's a fantastic feature. And you'll notice that the language server is also suggesting I, I don't need to import everything. I could just import GHCPS and HS Expert. But um, I do actually need things. So um, I'm going to refine my hole, as, as always. And now I can destruct on HE. And if I run destruct on HE, 
Wingman is going to write a huge amount of code for me, right? This is something like 50 constructors here. It's a really, really big data type. And not only did it write all this code for me, what it did is it went and looked at all the data constructors and then figured out the arity of each data constructor and came up with a, a unique name, maybe not a, a fantastic name, but a name that correlates to the type in some way. Um, and then it wrote out every single case for me, right? This is an incredible workflow, um, especially when working with GHC, which is a thing I do quite a lot in this project, um, where, like, can you imagine having to do this by hand, right? Because this code doesn't sort of exist in any place. There's the definition of the ADT, but the syntax of that is so different from uh, like function application or function definition syntax that um, there'd be quite a lot of like byte mangling in order to turn that into this. So I'd say this is save probably five minutes right here, right? And the amount of code I've generated is like, I don't know how much do you think? Like 1500 bytes, that's pretty good. There's one other thing I'd like to show you while I'm here. And um, that is that I can sort of do con continuous case destructing. And so if I go to the hole here, you'll notice I have case split on XV and GL. And I don't know what either of these are, but maybe let's, uh, let's do a case split on GL. And what it did, it was it replaced my, my function, right? My function clause, it used to be GL, and now it's an LSS of RN. Um, and so I can sort of continue and I can say, well, now maybe I want to split on SS. And say, oh, hey, like that split the data constructor scan, sort of in line and in a very sort of idiomatic way. And then maybe in this case, I want to split RN. And uh, again, it sort of just continuously goes out and builds and, um, and sort of splices in. And so this is a fantastic way for exploring libraries that you're not that familiar with, right? Rather than having to go through the haddock and keep like checking what are the data constructors, you can just do it all in your editor now. Um, so I, I, I love this. Uh, so there's one more thing I want to talk about before I dive into the tactic metaprogramming, and that's um, this is an example I stole from Edwin Brady, who's talking about uh, Idris 2. And in it, he sort of implemented this H list, right? And so if you're unfamiliar with an H list, it's a heterogeneous list, where a, a list in Haskell usually has the same type in it, right? Or always has the same type. So I might have a list of Booleans or a list of integers, and the list of integers may not contain any Booleans in it. In fact, it can't contain anything that isn't an integer. But an HList sort of solves this problem, um, where an HList sort of uses this type level machinery to say, I know what is in sort of what is the type at every index in the list. And so I can write an HList. I can say my HList. Um, and so maybe I've got an HCons of five, and then an HCons of true, and then an HCons of hello, and then H nil. And so this corresponds exactly with uh, the usual sort of um, list syntax, except instead of cons, it's called hcons and hnil. Uh, and so my list has what type, right? It's a h, it's actually, uh, well, wing, or language server will tell me on the right here. So I can sort of say, uh, add the signature. And that is the signature of this thing, right? So this is now a list where the first thing is an integer, the next thing is a Boolean, and the third thing is a character. And the, the, the problem I would like to solve is sort of, how do I pull something out of this, right? In, uh, in the prelude for regular lists, I have this function, which um, is called index up or something. And it takes an integer and then a list, and it gives you the element at that list. But it's not immediately clear um, sort of what is the type level equivalent of this, right? I can't just make this be each list of something, right? Because there's no guarantees that this A is the thing that I have. So the solution here is we write this lm at data type. And if you don't really understand what's going on, um, that's OK. This is sort of a dependently typed example. We're not going to dive in too deeply. But um, the idea sort of here is element is a proof that the element at this number here in this list is this type t. And the way it does it is not all that important. But you can think of this as a proof that I know the type of this thing. So the function I can write is called lm at, right? And it takes a type level lm at of uh, some index, and then the result type, and some types. And it takes an H list of those same types, and it gives me back the result type. And so the way we can think about this is if I have some list, and I know the element I want out of it, I know what type it is, I can just give you back that type. And if I were to implement this by hand, <coughs> excuse me, um, the way I could do it is sort of, again, sort of refine the whole. 
and then uh, I can do a destruct. There's an option called split all function arguments. And what this does is it does a, a destruct on every argument in scope uh, that's down by the top level function. And so it's sort of nice if I want to just iterate all of my, um, my data constructors at once. But hold on, there's something interesting going on here, right? I have two arguments, LMAT and HList, and they both have two data constructors. And so destructing everything should give me a Cartesian product of the data constructors, and there should be four clauses here. But in fact, there are only two, right? And is this a bug? No, this is not a bug. This is sort of, um, this is like dependently typed information that's happening sort of uh, that Wingman is aware of. And the way you can think about it is LM at is a proof that something is inside of this H list, right? But H nil corresponds to an empty H list. And so there is nothing that can be inside of it, right? Within, within an empty list, there is nothing. And so you can't get a proof that you have something inside of it. And so Wingman is actually smart enough to say, there are no H nil cases here. If you have a proof of something, then, then there is no empty case example. And um, like that's not a thing that's immediately evident as a, as a programmer, right? GHC might tell you that if you're, if you're compiling it, but um, as just like everyday programmer, that is not at all immediately evident. And so it's, it's very cool that Wingman will, will sort of, is familiar enough with type level machinery that it can, it can make that judgment call for you. If I were to sort of go on and implement this function, um, doing it with my brain is quite a lot of work. But the interesting thing here, uh, as Edwin Brady says, is sort of um, why do I have to, right? This sort of type level GATT is the program. And now Wingman, or Haskell just wants me to sort of articulate it at the value level. But there's only one implementation of it. So why do I need to do that myself? So again, let's, um, let's just sort of say, hey, Wingman, can you solve this for me? Again, I'll just say attempt to fill hole. And it turns for a little bit, turns a little further. And there we go. It's implemented this type level function for me. So it's sort of familiar, sort of with enough machinery that like not only does it identify that in this case, t is the result, but also that it needs to do recursion here, right? Um, and so this is one of the primary things that differentiates uh, Wingman from other sort of code synthesis tools like Jin, where Jin cannot handle recursion and uh, it doesn't handle gadgets or sort of any of the, the Haskell extensions. So it's, uh, it's quite an exciting set of tools here. So all this is just to show that um, Wingman can sort of write uh, dependently typed uh, programs, right? Which is uh, very exciting to me. So um, that's sort of all I have to say about the code actions. And now the, the remainder of the talk is to think about sort of this new kind of programming that I alluded to. And there's a lot of times in Haskell that we, that we write programs, um, but there's no good way of, of abstracting over it, right? And often we call these idioms because it's idiomatic, but there's no way to automate it. It's a pattern that clearly exists, but it's unclear how we can use the usual tools to automate these things, right? Of course, there's always gonna be template Haskell, um, but template Haskell is quite wieldy and it's got all sorts of weird performance things and cross compilation issues. And, um, and then also sort of template Haskell sort of requires buy-in from, from your team or something, right? Like if not everybody's on board to use template Haskell, then it's gonna be quite hard to get through code review. Um, and so, so that's sort of the motivation here. And the way we can sort of look at this is to say, uh, I'm gonna write a type here. And this is sort of a meaningless type. I'm just making something up here. Uh, maybe there's an S to a, a here. And maybe there's another data constructor, which is a list of bars, I don't know. This, this type is meaningless, it means nothing. I just wrote it. Um, and what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna write a functor instance for this thing. Uh, something that Haskell Language Server will do for me is um, it'll just say add placeholders and then it sort of adds all the function methods I need. Um, and that's nice because it, it pipelines very nicely with Wingman. Um, so now I'm in fmap. And so again, I can sort of refine my whole and then I can um, pattern match on foo and now I can sort of fill in my arguments. And so fab of a and now this is fab after fsa and then this is fmap of fmap of fab on x zero. <laughs> um, and so I'd like us to look at this, right? 
And my claim is that this is the functor instance, right? This is the functor instance. And probably everyone agrees with me, right? And I'd like to believe people agree with me, not because I'm Sandy McGuire, but because they look at this and say, yes, obviously this is the functor instance, right? And my question for you is, how do you know, right? How are we so all? How are we all so familiar with the like the the? How are we confident that this is in fact the functor instance? And if you're sort of like deep in the literature, you might say something about you know there's a, a theorem for free that comes here of sort of given the type, this is the only thing it will type check, and I mean that's true, um, but I don't think that's what we're doing, right? And if you're more categorically minded, you might think sort of to yourself, oh, there's naturality involved here, right? And the naturality sort of um, says, well, there's rules of functors and if it satisfies them all. And that is like, also true. But my suspicion is that nobody in the audience, when they looked at this, they drew sort of the commuting diagram in their head and chased the arrows and said, ah, yes, every way through the square commutes. Like, I don't think that's what anyone's doing. And so it's nice that we have these techniques, but they're sort of more... Um, they're more analytical than is what happens or what feels like it's happening when we're programming, right? What seems to be happening when we're programming sort of something more, um, there's a little more intuition going on, right? It's a little more instinctive. Um, and so the way that my brain seems to work for this, at least, is, is more pattern matching, sort of mental pattern matching rather than Haskell pattern matching. Um, and so in my brain, I sort of have a lot of rules for what a functor instance looks like. And I have a bunch of rules for what a functor instance doesn't look like. And I can sort of just run through both of those lists. And I say, well, you know, this thing looks like a functor instance, and it doesn't not look like a functor instance. So probably is a functor instance, right? And the fact that there's no type errors suggests that, yeah, I mean, there's only one way to write a functor instance, uh, you know, up to isomorphism. And so, so it's probably right, right? If all of my little heuristics uh, pass, then this thing is probably a functor instance. Um, and that's that's fine, right? But uh, but that just sort of changes the question to what does a functor instance look like? And it's not entirely clear, right? Um, so we can think about what a functor is, right? And a functor takes a function from A to B, and it replaces all the A's into Bs using that function. And it's not allowed to do anything else. And that not doing anything else part is, is naturality, right? But it's also sort of more importantly a syntactic operation, right? Uh, we can think about that in terms of how does it, how does the code look? So one consequence of not doing anything else is that it's not allowed to change the data constructor, right? If I'm F mapping over something, then if I'm only allowed to change the A's, then the data constructor is not NA, so I can't change the data constructor. Therefore, I've mapped foo to foo, and I've mapped bar to bar, right? Um, another thing that I'm not allowed to do in a functor is to sort of shuffle around my arguments, right? And so that means sort of, if I unpack arguments, I have to pack them up in the same order. So it goes S, A, F, S, A, and then S, A, F, S, A, and X zero, again, X zero, right? Um, and then there's sort of, so those are sort of the high level ideas. And then within the code, um, for every hole, if that type doesn't uh, mention A whatsoever, I must just sort of give it back as I found it, right? I'm not allowed to change it in any way. However, if a, um, if a hole does mention A, then if it is A, I must apply FAB. And if it isn't, a, but it doesn't mention A, then I sort of need to F map my way through it. And you might say, hold on, Sandy, this thing is not an F map. Uh, to what I would uh, retort that, yes, it is, right? Um, the, the F map instance or the functor instance for arrow, the function arrow is equal to dot. And so these are two equivalent programs. And so written like this, it sort of becomes a little more clear about what's going on, which is Whenever I have a type that um, mentions A, a term that mentions A in its type, um, what I can do is sort of apply fmap some amount of times, and then sort of as many as I need to make a type check, and then I can just produce uh, the value. So what's interesting about that is the number of times I want to apply fmap might be zero, right? I don't actually need to apply fmap if, if A is just this thing. And so 
So sort of that's my claim is that a functor, at least one that um, is built out of composition of functors, uh, is exactly this. It sort of maps uh, data constructors to data constructors. It doesn't change the order of the construct of the terms inside the constructor. And then um, for every term that doesn't mention a, it's you just give it back. And for every term that does mention a, you have to apply f map some number of times, uh, and then apply f a b, and then that that's it, right? So, so that's sort of the the idea, right? Rather than just slamming this thing out, I, I took some time to analyze it and to think about like, not just how do I write this, but sort of more generally, what am I trying to write? And so we can sort of write this tactically. So if I run code action, something you might have noticed earlier is this, uh, this fourth code action here, use custom tactic block. And if I type that in, it builds a wingman uh, tactic. Um, this thing is using template Haskell syntax, but there, there's no template Haskell going on here. It's just, I needed to find something in the GHT AST that would let me type a string and still type check. And this was sort of the only thing I found. So, so don't, don't worry, it looks like template Haskell, but it isn't. It's just a convenient way for me to write strings. So if I wanted to write a program here, um, the idea is a tactics program is sort of a high level sort of abstract view of the code I'm trying to write. And I can I can run these programs and they will synthesize code for me. So um, the way it looks is actually quite imperative. And so maybe the first thing I want to do is call intros. And I can run this custom tactic. And running intros, as we saw before, is sort of just uh, equivalent to making a lambda and binding the, the variables. You'll notice again that it picked two names for me, f, uh, a, b, and foo. Um, and sometimes that's what you want, but sometimes it isn't. And so if it isn't what you want, um, you can explicitly give names here after intros, and that will then um, use these names that I've given. And so they, they happen in order. And so now if I run this program, all of a sudden what used to be f, a, b, and foo are now f and x. And so, OK, well, that's fine. Um, but what I can do now is I can use a comma operator, and that allows me to, to run a subsequent tactic after I did the first one. And so now the subsequent tactic will work on the next hole. So the next hole I have um, is just I want to destruct x, right? And so if I run this now, I've destructed x, right? Now I, I've done a pattern match onto foo and bar. So it's sort of quite a lot of work to go back and forth and always be saying, well, you know, run the code, unrun the code. And so one thing I can do in Wingman is I can do use my hover action in uh, the language server. And for Vim, I have that bound to, to some key. On VS Code, you can just uh, use your mouse cursor and hover over the squiggly line. And when I do that, I get this little pop-up on the bottom. I have two goals, right? Those correspond to the two cases I need to fill in. And they both have type foo sb, but Above that line is sort of what I have in scope in order to, to implement that. And so what I have in scope for both of them is an F. And then what I have in scope otherwise is the terms that I unpacked. And so Wingman is sort of smart enough to keep track of, like, I'm synthesizing code, and I'm in different branches, and those different branches know different things. And so I can just say, hey, um, this is sort of a quicker way often to, to look at the state of your, of your tactic. Um, so what's the next thing I want to do? So uh, the next thing I think I want to do is use a constructor to say foo, right? So if I'm unpacking foo, I need to repack foo. And so if I run this, now again, I've produced a foo term. And I've now made three new holes corresponding to each, um, each sort of argument to the foo constructor. The next thing I want to do is sort of say, well, I have an s. And s doesn't mention a, so I just want to give it back, right? Um, there's an assumption tactic, and that says, just take anything that's in scope that has the right type and put it there. Which sounds a little crazy, but as you'll notice, it does, in fact, produce the foo s. But hold on, you might think. Like, that's crazy, Sandy. What if you have another s in scope? How does it know which one to use? Um, so fundamentally, there, here, there, there is quite a lot of non-determinism. And my claim is that it doesn't really matter. And the reason it doesn't really matter is the way that Wingman works is it will actually synthesize every sort of solution of the non-deterministic set. And then it scores them based on a bunch of sort of heuristics that correspond very well to what humans find to be the right code. Um, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I'm saying it does a very good job and almost never does this, um, does this sort of non-determinism bite you. So 
anyway, uh, so I've undone my S change and I've done assumption. And so what's the next hole I have? The next hole I have is a B that I want to produce. And I don't have a B in scope, so I can't run assumption. And let's just try to run assumption just to do it, right? If I try to run assumption here, it says, oh, wingman couldn't find a solution. And that's because there was no B in scope to stick in. So instead, I have a B and I want to apply F. Right, F is going to produce a B. And so I can use um, the apply tactic. And apply takes a function name. So I can say apply F. And if I run this, now all of a sudden it says, hey, uh, I've produced F. And it left another hole for the argument. And so you can sort of see the, the idea here, right? Is each time along the way you say, I have a tactic. It's going to fill in this part. And it might produce more holes that I will need to fill in. Those, those holes get filled in sequentially. Something I can also do if I don't care about applying f in particular, I can say application, which is sort of the same as assumption. It says pick any function in scope that will type check and then run that. And so if I do that again, I get f. Um, and so you can sort of now, so now I need an a, right, to, as the argument to f. And so I can again say assumption. And you'll notice this isn't a different assumption here. This assumption is at type s, and this assumption is at type a. And Wingman just knows how to do it. So I'm sort of now, I've moved from a level of thinking about sort of syntactically what I'm doing to sort of a little higher level talking about, um, I don't really care the actual specifics, I'm just going to write code and it's going to sort of suggest things. But there's a bit of a flaw here, isn't there? And that flaw is if you look at the implementation of FMAP, it's already quite shorter. It's like quite a bit shorter than this program I've written. Um, and furthermore, this program I'm writing seems to be sort of no better. It seems, it, in fact, it sort of seems worse, right? It feels like I'm just writing um, Haskell now, but with sort of bad imperative syntax. And that is true. I am writing Haskell with bad imperative syntax. And this is mostly just to get a, to give you a sense of sort of how tactics work and what are they. Um, I'm not saying this is a tactic program you should write. So the, the if we wanted to write this sort of more idiomatically, tactically. Um, the idea is we want to sort of work at a higher level of semantics. And if you remember my discussion about what is a functor instance, we talked about sort of, um, we, we had this high level idea of, you know, we have to map data constructors to data constructors. But then this code I wrote sort of destructs x and then picks a specific data constructor. And so that's sort of already moving away from the high level semantic idea that I wanted to express. And so I'm going to say we, we, we sort of took a wrong turn right at the beginning. And what I want to do is not actually a, a destruct, right? I don't want to do a pattern match here. I want to do sort of a pattern match with some flavor. And that flavor I want to do is to match every uh, every case to the same data constructor. And so that's not a destruct, right? Destruct is sort of lower level than that. In fact, that's a homomorphic case split. And so I can use the homo um, tactic here. And what this does is I run this now, and it immediately produces the, um, the data constructor on either side. So it's sort of semantically closer to what I wanted. And once I have, have this, now, rather than sort of filling in each of these holes individually, I remember, again, my analysis said, um, if a type doesn't, if a hole doesn't represent uh, A, then we just give it back. Otherwise, we, we implement F maps. And sort of the implication there is that this is for every hole, right? And so um, the tactics language gives me a way to bind over every hole. Um, and I say bind because implementing this is, is a monad. Um, so I can use a semicolon instead of a comma. And the semicolon says, I would like to run the subsequent tactic at every hole that exists. Whereas comma says, I would like to run the tactic at the next hole that exists. And so, um, so I can say semicolon. And now I can say sort of assumption, right? And so what this would do is it would fill in every hole with an assumption. But if I run this, it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is, as we saw earlier, there is nothing in scope that is B. Right? And so assumption doesn't work in that hole. And sort of the semantics here is that every hole needs to succeed with the, with the semicolon operation. And so because not every hole succeeds here, then th this bind doesn't work. But um, again, my analysis suggested you know, we can either use an assumption or we can do something else. The nice thing about um, the type of F map is that both A and B are scolums, which means um, there's sort of no way to get them, right? And so if if I have type, if I have a hole that mentions B, there is no way to have an assumption of that thing, right? Because this thing fundamentally just cannot exist just based on the type system. So I need not sort of worry myself about 
what if an assumption matches something that it shouldn't because it can't. So the other thing I want to do is say um, it's either an assumption or it's some number of f maps. And in order to express some number of f maps, I can say with arg. And with arg is sort of this pattern here where I can say foo is five. And it's like, well, actually, I don't. I, I want to apply some function to five, but I don't know what that function is. And so with arg sort of makes two holes. And it makes the argument happen sooner than the function. So with arg lets me then the next thing I fill in will be one and then two. So uh, I can say I want to fill in the next uh, the next hole, which is comma, right? Not semicolon, because that hole fills in every hole. Um, and the thing I'd like to fill in here is sort of the argument to f map that I'm f mapping over. And so that thing is just an assumption. So if I run the, oh, I don't think I want to run this. Sometimes uh, that'll be tempting the demo gods. I don't want to do that. So, um, so the next thing I say is I want to apply some number of f maps in this hole I have, right? And I could say um, apply f map, but I don't want to because um, that's only maybe one f map. And so what I actually want is a nested f map. And so nested is a combinator that will take a function and apply it in its first argument, sort of as many times as necessary in order to get something to type check. Behind the scenes, this is just using the pipe operator and synthesizing sort of every possibility from 0 to 100. And then any of those which don't subsequently type check just get eliminated immediately, and we don't consider them. So finally, um, the expression I have sort of is will look like this. I've filled in x0 with the first assumption, and the nest f map has uh, implemented this part. And so now I just have this hole left. And so I can here now say assume f. And if I run this, all of a sudden, it's implemented fmap for me, right? Um, and I think it's probably completely equivalent to this other one. Yeah, maybe modulo some some naming. Um, this is exactly the equivalent function. But what's what's really exciting here? Oh, and just I, one last thing before I do this is I can assume f, but I can also just use assumption because assumption is also the only thing that will type check here, uh, and that works as well. But maybe that's being a little too clever and tempting fate. So, so. The, the really interesting thing to notice here is that nothing about this definition mentions anything about foo, right? I'm just saying operate on the data constructors and then fill it in with an assumption or f map. And what that means is I can now sort of go back and change foo willy-nilly. I can say uh, maybe there's a zoo in here and maybe that's uh, an s, but maybe here I've got a, a maybe, maybe, I don't know, we'll put a maybe here. We'll say maybe a, we'll say, we can just we'll just change it like crazy, right? And so I've changed this type, but I haven't changed the tactic. The tactic remains exactly the same. But if I run this tactic, all of a sudden it now synthesizes the new functor, right? An equivalent functor um, in a way that I didn't have to think about. You'll notice that um, I used to have another instance down here. In terms of sort of code written, this is roughly the same amount of code. I think if you look at it, this is maybe uh, 200 bytes, and there's maybe 100 bytes of code here. Um, and that, that sounds, you know, it's the same order of magnitude. But the nice thing about this is I only needed to write this once. And this implementation is sort of good. This tactic will work for any type whose functor instance is a composition of functor instances. So it doesn't work if you have an either with an A on the left side. Um, because there is no fmap instance for that. Or at least fmap doesn't do what you want in that case. But um, that's not a fundamental limitation. That's just, you know, if you were a little more clever with how you wrote this, you could do that. Um, you could sort of add another branch here saying what to do. Maybe you could use a by map or something. Um, so the idea is sort of I, I only needed to write this program once, sort of ever. And I also didn't need to have written it in the sense of, this works for anyone. And so someone else could have written this, this tactic for me. And they could have solved this problem. And if, you know, if, if there were sort of a tactics library somewhere, I could just pull that in. And now anytime I ever needed to write a functor, I don't need to. I can just say, well, someone solved this problem for me. Um, so like that, that's really exciting to me, right? The idea that this is now sort of a solved problem for everyone forever. Um, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Sandy, you idiot, obviously, right? There's already a solved problem for everyone forever, and GHC can do that today. But uh, what GHC can't do today is sort of semi-groups and monoids, right? So let's say I have a data type called zoop, and maybe zoop is a sum of integers, and it's a string, and it's an any, right? 
I need to import these. And again, I can just do that from the language server. And sort of everyone knows what these instances look like, right? Um, the composition, or sort of the, the monoid over the product is the product over the monoid. Um, and so I can say add some placeholders, add some placeholders, um, refine the whole. You can say destruct everything. And now if I need to write this, I mean, it's so much work, right? Why do I have to do this? This is terrible. And then the, the monoid is sort of even stupider. It's sort of zoop, I don't know where zooper came from. Empty, 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 where these should be have been empty all along. So these uh, these are instances I'm sure sort of everyone has written a million times, right? You just you push the the monoid or the semigroup through the data constructor. And if if my colleague were to ask, saying like, Sandy, what is the semigroup instance for Zoop? I'd say it's a homomorphism, and they'd say, Oh, cool, thank you, I understand now, right? And so why can't I just tell the computer that it's a homomorphism? Why do I have to go through the work of like ex articulating the homomorphismness of this? So this is another good opportunity for um, for a tactic. And so we'll do the, the monoid cases first because it's sort of easier. Um, and so what I want to do is produce a data constructor and then fill in everything with Memty. And the way I can produce a data constructor is with the split tactic, which is a bit terribly named, I will admit. Um, it sounds like it should do a pattern match. But split sort of takes a product uh, goal, and it turns it into um, a goal of product, and it turns it into a product of goals. And so the idea is sort of this thing takes one, and it will split it into all the pieces you need. So essentially, this thing creates a data constructor. So if I run this, it creates a data constructor. And then I just say use Memty, and now that implements Memty for me. In order to do the other one, um, again, sort of I need to, as sort of always, I'm going to make some, uh, some new lines here. As always, I sort of need to bind my variables. And then I can say destruct all. And as you might expect, that does the pattern match for me. And now, right, so now I need to, again, make a, a data constructor. So I can use split again. And then at every hole, I can say use mapend. And let's try that, right? And so what that done is it's just implemented mapend everywhere. And it's left holes for me. And you might expect me to just say now assumption. And that is sort of correct, but not quite. Um, and the issue here is, oh, did I keep my instance? There, there's sort of a, a constraint I hadn't mentioned. And that constraint is that the left side of every mapend must come from the first argument. right? Otherwise, it's not really this homomorphic structure that we're looking for. And the right side of every one must come from the second argument. Hopefully, I can go back, and yes. Um, and so I sort of want a way to restrict the, the capability, like sort of what I know about for my assumption. And the way I can do that is using the pointwise uh, co tactic combinator. And so what this does is it says, um, hey, you use this tactic and figure out all the holes it produces. And then it's going to zip the holes it produced against um, the top level argument and says, the first hole is only allowed to use terms that are derived from the first, uh, the first argument. And likewise, the second from the second argument. And so now this function, I claim, does what I want, oh, this tactic. And as you see, it just sort of implements everything we wanted. Again, this is, um, this is sort of delightful, right? I, I've solved the problem once and for all. Um, and also, what's particularly gnarly here is that, um, let's say I have an endo on integers and maybe a set of characters, I have to import set, is the amount of code input to implement these functions is linear in the number of arguments. Right? If I, this code here is linear in the number of arguments to zoop. Um, but the tactic doesn't change sizes. The tactic is a constant size. And you can sort of really see the value of the semicolon of just doing the same thing at every hole. Um, so I have one final example to show you. Oh, actually, um, before I do, um, again, this is sort of too much work. And what we could have just done is written auto. And that does exactly the same thing. Um, behind the scenes, it's auto is just running exactly this program. I just sort of got bored of having to write it every time. Uh, auto, it turns out, is the exact same thing as running attempt to fill code, uh, attempt to fill hole. So those are one and the same, which means you can sort of use the smart, like, figure anything out tactic from within tactics themselves. Um, so there's one final uh, example I'd like to show you. And that is um, sort of 
everything I've shown you so far has been, well, it's like a, it's an instance, maybe wingman's only useful for instances, but no, that's not true. Um, one thing we often like to do in Haskell is to write sort of like little languages. And so maybe I've got an AST, right? And so this thing corresponds to some sort of type checked program um, where maybe I've got int literals and it takes an integer and gives me an AST of int. And maybe I've got a bool literal and maybe I've got an if statement, right? And so if takes an AST that's a bool and then an AST of an A, two of those, and it gives me back sort of whichever one, right? If it's true, it gives me the left one. It gives me false, it gives me the right one. Um, and we'll say, I guess we also have an equals term. And so we can say eek of A, and if we have two eeks, then we can give back uh, an AST of bool, right? And so this is like, a, we can write a term here and then anything that type checks in Haskell, we'll type check in this little language I've written. And the way you often see this is you say, well, I've written this AST, and so there's always this function that AS, called eval, right? And it says, if I have an AST of Booleans, I would like to produce a Boolean, right? Because this A sort of corresponds to the type that I want to produce eventually at the end of this program. So if I were to write this by hand, right? Um, I can refine and then destruct, and you sort of, it's always the same, right? Uh, I'm going to do some quick renaming here, AST1, AST2, this is AST3. I can say, well, if eval AST1, then eval AST2, otherwise eval AST3, right? Um, and then in this case, I can say eval AST1 is equal to eval AST2. Oh, and I have to delete this. That fine? Are you happy? I might have to restart the language server. Sometimes it gets a little drunk. Um, so this is a, sort of a, a program, right? And it's it's a common pattern. Um, I'm using a get here just for the challenge, but anytime you write a fold, it sort of has the same structure. Um, so there, there's quite a lot of challenges here, and you might not immediately see how to write this thing tactically, and I didn't for the longest time either. Um, and the, some of the challenges are we have this a thing that's a get it, right? And in the first branch, a is an integer, but in the second branch, it's a boolean. So age sort of changes types as we go through, right? We also have um, some recursive bits on inductive parts of the data type. And then sort of each code path looks quite different from one another. So the question is sort of how do I write this tactically, right? Um, and the, the first step in sort of, to, to do this requires a bit of a, a mental shift, right? To, to ask yourself, what is it I'm trying to write rather than how do I write it? And so what is it I'm trying to write is sort of, actually it's more of a fold, right? And so if I were to write this a little differently, I could say, well, let's say I've got AST1 result is equal to eval AST1. And so I can sort of put all my recursive bits in one place. And then I can uh, sort of implement the rest in terms of those, right? So R and R and R. What did I just do, AST1? Um, I can do the sort of same thing here on the bottom line, right? In and then uh, this. Got a lot of work to, to do all this. And I can sort of do the same thing for these ones, right? These ones don't actually have any recursive bindings, but this is completely valid Haskell. And it sort of makes it clear that there is no recursive um, calls here. So this is a little closer. It's a little easier to see the structure here, right? Um, and and now sort of the only question here is how, where do we go from this one, right? And the idea now is if you look at the, the ins, it's sort of just a function over what's ever in scope now, right? And this thing isn't really an if then else, it's actually the function if then else, right? Uh, and that isn't in scope, so we can just go and define that really quickly. Oh. Um, and so now it's sort of quite clear what the pattern is, right? The pattern is um, we're going to sort of recursively call all of our inductive pieces, and then we're going to run a function over every all the work that we did. And if we didn't do any work, we'll just sort of give back the one we had. So let's write this thing tactically. Um, so again, we can sort of use custom tactic block, and I don't even need to do multi-line here because this is such a, this one's really easy. Uh, so as always, I need to intro. And then I'm going to, I need to destruct, right? But it's not a destruct again. It's sort of something higher level. And it's not a homomorphism because I'm not producing an AST at the end of the day. What this thing is, is a catamorphism, right? And a catamorphism sort of comes from the same root word as uh, 
cat catastrophe or cataclysm of sort of like tearing down. Um, so this thing is a cation X. And just doing this, you'll see we'll actually do all that recursive shuffling for me. And it just leaves holes behind. It, oh, and it's also smart enough to not do this sort of stupid let like empty let binding. Um, but conceptually, that's the work it's doing. Um, and then at every hole, what we would just need to do is say collapse. And collapse will take everything that's in scope that seems relevant and uh, run it as a function argument. And so if we do that, all of a sudden you'll notice it's filled in N and B, right? Because those were the only thing in scope that was relevant and they type check. So you might as well just stick them in. Um, and otherwise, uh, it's left holes. And these holes are sort of the only interesting parts of the computation, right? Uh, so I can just go and I can fill in these holes. And say, well, that one's this, and this is if and else. That's the whole program, right? Again, um, this is like the most common pattern I've run into actually so far in Wingman is is folds like this. And it took a little thinking, uh, and a huge shout outs to Top Wolf for giving me uh, for like walking me through sort of what are the pieces I need. So, um, as always, I can sort of add new constructors here stringlet and you know I can add a substring operation or whatever and the tactic just adapts and it does the right thing and so um, I'm running out of time so there's a few just sort of wrapping up things I'd like to discuss and then I'll open up for questions um, but sort of there's a bit of a call for action here and the call is sort of the hardest thing right now is not engineering but it's sort of the conceptual workload and I would love to sort of get more people trying this because really all the only thing that we need right now is more people thinking about it and thinking about what's the right approach and sort of what are the building blocks I need. Um, the machinery behind all of this is is like extremely flexible and um, if you if you sort of need a new base tactic, one that doesn't exist yet, the turnaround for that is probably on the order of hours. Um, so we, we can iterate really fast. Um, so I'd love to, to just get people trying this and trying to write tactics and sort of thinking through like what sorts of problems can we solve if we think about them in a different way and what sorts of problems can't we solve with the existing bits and please file bugs for those sorts of things. So with that, I'm gonna leave you. Um, I've got some links here. These are some resources. Um, there's a there's a reference here for all of the commands you might run on, run in tactics. Um, it's quite comprehensive. It's got examples for every tactic that exists, and I keep it up to date. Um, and it's all computer generated as well, so it's not going to get out of date. Um, and I guess there's a bit of a plea here as well, which is um, I, I've got a Patreon for this. This has sort of been my the only thing I've been working on for the last year. I'm unemployed intentionally just because I think open source is a fantastic thing to be to be doing, um, and I think there's a lot of like good value here. Um, Unfortunately, it's sort of not financially viable um, today, and I would love it to be. I, I'm not trying to get rich off of this. I'm just trying to pay rent. And so, um, so if you if you've been inspired by this today, and sort of if this is a direction you think the world should be moving in, um, if you consider donating like five euros a month, like if everyone did that, uh, who's watching this talk, that would like profoundly change my financial situation to be able to work on this. Um, and if not, I'll still love you. And I, this community is fantastic and means everything to me. So please don't if you can't, but um, do consider if you can. I really encourage it. So uh, without, with, without that, I'd, I'd love to open up for questions and see, um, be able to answer anything people are wondering about. Thank you very much, Sandy. In case you've been following the discussion, uh, there is a lot of praise for you there. I, I encourage you to go and take a look at that later oh, after the talk. Cool, thank you. People, people are very starry-eyed, and so am I by looking at this stuff. It's great stuff. Thanks. Um, I'm, just gonna, I'm just going to take a look at uh, look at the questions. One sure. that I have um, saved up here. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go chronologically through them. Yeah, of course. So, uh, the first question, is it possible to refine holes with quick check tests for them from Michel? Um, I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, oh, I, I think the idea being sort of to write a quick check property and then see if it passes and use that. Um, that's not supported today. I don't see any reason it couldn't be supported um, in general. Right now, there's not a great interface for sort of running arbitrary code um, in the language server. So it's hard to like write code that you want to run in the language server and then run it immediately. Um, there might be support for that today, but I don't know what it is. So. Um, I know some other tactics libraries do support this. Um, 
so it's a thing I'm interested in. I just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. Cool. Thanks. Here's a question from Gautier. Um, what are the performances, rep responsiveness and latency on big on a big code base? So 50 to 1,000, 50 to 100,000 lines of code. Um, the, the, the responsiveness here is more on the module size than anything else. There's a performance bug in HLS that I'm currently trying to push a solution through, but it's a little trickier than I know how to deal with um, currently. Um, but the, the responsiveness is, is, is fantastic, so long as you don't have too many things in scope. Um, because the way the proof search works is it tries just everything. It just does the dumbest thing and tries every possible program. And um, that's sort of exponential in the number of things that you have in scope. And Wingman tries to do a lot of really clever things to sort of prune that search space, but fundamentally it's always going to be exponential. Um, so I also have some, some timeouts. So it tries not to run more than two seconds and you can change that if you want to, if you have something particular that's trying to solve that. So that's gnarly. Um, but sometimes the timeout doesn't work and it will freeze up and I don't have a great solution for that. But, um, but it's gotten to the point where it's sort of usable for, for real life things. Cool, thanks. Next question. What if you make a mistake in choosing the right tactic? Then it'll write the wrong code, right? Um, the, um, there's, it's sort of, you can't get too much of a foot gun here, right? Because all of this is type checked. And so if you choose the wrong tactic, if the tactic you choose isn't meaningful, then it won't do any work and it'll just fail. Um, as I showed sort of with assumption earlier, um, there are there is also the, the ability to sort of make a bad choice that does produce a lot of work. And again, that's just gonna hit the time up behavior. So um, I don't think it's it's too much of an issue if you choose the wrong tactic other than you might not get the program you were hoping for. And so I think the solution to that is just to become familiar with the tactic library and um, and sort of the tool at your disposal. Cool. I have a related question with this. So what do you actually save? So you went back and forth between the tactic and the actual generated code. So yeah. I guess you save the generated code, right? So where does that the tactic true. live? The tactic okay. doesn't live anywhere. Um, okay. And I think that's sort of both a feature and a bug. Um, I would love this stuff to be supported directly in GHC, um, but we're not in that world today. And so this is sort of more of maybe a proof of concept for that. Um, all of this stuff is sort of ephemeral. And um, I, have, I have some like draft PRs where you can sort of save tactics and then pull them up again later. Um, again, sort of the challenge is always the interface more so than anything else. And interactively doing this is quite a challenge because um, the language server does just doesn't give us a lot of options for the protocol. Um, so, so sort of something I've been thinking about and my solution to this is sort of to leave your tactic as a comment, saying, here's how I synthesize this thing. Um, but uh, yeah, at the end of the day, you can't run the tactic, and you'll get a, an error in the compiler if you attempt to. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another related question from me now, and also maybe from someone else there. Um, how do you, uh, so can you build tactics on top of other tactics? Or, you know, I want to my, write my own tactic. I, I've discovered a sort of pattern in my code. I want to write yeah. a tactic for this. What do I do? Um, so that was sort of one of the original choices here for, for not just making code actions was that um, a lot of the feature requests I were getting were for people with like very specific sort of patterns they wanted to implement. So today, the only option is to just write that um, the tactic yourself and sort of th there's no current abstraction capabilities. Again, I think that will come from when I get support for saving these things in. Um, I do have a, a draft PR that lets you sort of um, define your own tactics as sort of like abstraction wise and put them in a common place and they'll get picked up. Um, none of that's merged yet, but again, there's no fundamental difficulties. It's mostly just engineering time to, to make it happen. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So let, let's me go, let me go back to the thread. Sure. Um, so can we keep it in this quasi quoted form? So even if uh, the definition of foo gets changed, we don't want to regenerate that instance of implementation again. So I guess the question means that, can I keep it there somehow? Yeah, unfortunately not today, no. Um, again, just mm -hmm. commented out. It's not a great solution, but um, again, like this is just one guy working on it. And so um, <laughs> I would love to, to get this into like a really uh, robust form. And ideally, if we could just get it merged into GHC, that's the real dream. Um, yeah. but that's not gonna happen today. 
Cool, thanks. Uh, next question. I already have performance issues with HLS, so I'm also having concerns here that it might hang or require lots of RAM. Um, I think that's unfortunate Comment. case. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I personally haven't had issues with HLS. I've gotten a robot working on um, GHC itself, and so that's quite a large code base. And so um, my understanding is it's sort of template Haskell that often is what makes HLS go wrong, but I also am not in a position to really comment on that. I don't I don't really know much about HLS other than I've implemented on top of it. Um, and then I guess the other thing is I have identified that performance uh, bottleneck. Unfortunately, fixing it sort of reduces some features, and so there's a little bit of a discussion on what should we do about that. Um, so I'm still trying to solve that, and I think that'll dramatically improve performance on the order of like a few, a few orders of magnitude. So hopefully that'll help. Cool, thanks. Next question. Is there a way to print out the steps used for auto? Um, no, there isn't. Um, however, uh, sort of the de there's a debug log that's produced by this, and I don't know how to see it in Vim, but in VS Code, you can there's a there's an option to show it. And when you run a tactic, it will um, it'll print out sort of all the things it tried and um, sort of how they scored. There is internal support for like what actual series of tactics got run. Um, and I can't remember, at some point it was printed out, but I can't remember if it's currently being printed out. Um, I think it might not be. So the support is there, but I don't think it's currently exposed. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Next question. Would it be possible in theory to generate tactics from the sequence of winged man code actions performed? I guess you already answered that at the moment, not. Uh, yeah. uh, at the moment, not, but absolutely. Um, there, there's no reason it couldn't be, right? Like. Yeah. It's just to uh, put some commas and semicolons and then write down. So it's all, it's all sort of the same code base behind the scenes. And so there's no reason you couldn't connect them. But again, usually the, the interface is the hard part. Um, and and sort of dealing with text is, is quite annoying. Um, there's quite a lot of bugs in, in splicing things where just the tools for, for splicing code are not very easy to use. And so um, often, like those are most of the bugs right now of just if you have a new new line in the wrong place, things will get misaligned things. Mm. Cool, thanks. Next question. How much of what you've shown today is in HLS now? Um, so all of this is in HLS. Um, there was a new release, I think, seven days ago, version 1.2 or something. Um, I've merged quite a lot of fixes in the last week of preparing for this talk, um, in particular, the dependently type stuff. Um, I don't think that will have worked in the current release. And the nested FMAP stuff also is, doesn't exist. But I think everything else should be there. Um, and so I want to thank Zuri Hack as well just for sort of lighting a, a fire under me to, to really polish all these things. So um, these things are in head. And so if you're willing to build for yourself, you have access to all of this. Cool. Thanks. Let me just go through the Discord channel again to see if there are any questions in the meanwhile. OK. Oh, lots of clapping happening. Thank you. <laughs> OK, um, question. What is the direction you want to go with Wingman in the future? Um, the direction I want, I think the, the next obvious step is to to sort of get the, the abstraction level working. And so making you be able to define your own tactics, save those, um, probably ideally hook that up as well to the code action list. And so you can have a drop down. Um, to, like, that, that's sort of the most obvious thing, right, of, of just good abstraction working. Um, a lot of these tactics I showed today are sort of necessary only because we don't have abstraction. So that nested fmap thing could very easily have not been uh, built in, and it could have just been a thing. But without abstraction, you can't sort of tie the knot and do recursion. So that's, that's mm -hmm. the immediate direction I'd like to go. Um, and then there's a lot of performance work I, I'd like to do. Um, auto is unfortunately like sort of too slow most of the time. It's really good for small polymorphic combinators. Um, it's sort of less useful in, in often other places. So those are the, the big things on my radar. I also have a, um, a huge document of sort of would-be features if I wanted. Um, another thing in particular is sort of finding good names. You'll notice the names like are not beautiful. There's a lot of dashes and hyphens and things. And um, believe it or not, like the naming is 100 times better than it was last year. Um, but again, it would be nice to get sort of names that you don't need to always go through and change. Cool. 
Next question. How does the power of this compare to generic programming context? These examples remind me of data type generic programming. For example, yeah. the semi-group instance generation in um, yeah. blah, blah. Right. Um, so they compare in the sense of they do the same thing, right? Um, but the generic stuff is, I'd say, a bit of a hack, right? Where in order to do a generic thing, you need to build get a generic instance from from GHC, and then you need to write this like type class that doesn't correspond to anything, and then you have to give instances for each of uh, each each sort of way of building a generic type for this type class, and then sort of hook them all together, and then hope at runtime all those things got fused away by the optimizer, right? Um, so it's actually quite a lot of work. And so the nice thing about that technique is it is quite amenable to Haskell libraries and modules. And so you can just import a package. Um, but it sort of imposes a cost on everyone in that sense, right? The nice thing about this tactic stuff is I can just run this locally. It doesn't require buy-in from anyone else. Um, I don't need to get like my team lead to agree to use it. I can just sort of synthesize code myself and pretend I wrote it. Um, <laughs> Right, so it, it sort of solves the same problem, but in, in a very different direction. Um, and also, I, th I think it's it, something. One of one of the first cases I used this this catamorphism stuff was for was to to implement like a generic instance myself. Where mostly of the time when you're doing generic instances, the only interesting part is in K one, right? Which is sort of I've gotten through all the generic machinery, and here's the actual types I care about. So most of the work you're doing is just routing to there and then doing something. So um, I guess the answer to, the, to your question is uh, it does the same thing, but maybe more efficiently and more easily. Cool. Thanks. Um, um, here's a question. So this is a question I, even I had. So lots of people were just commenting that, oh, this looks look like uh, lean or cock and things like that. So the concrete question, and, and when I was looking at it, I was thinking, oh, this yeah. looks a lot like the Isabel tactics that I've seen. And uh, the question is, what are the source of what were the sources of inspiration for designing tactics? They seem quite similar to lean or cock tactics. So what was your inspiration for this? I, I, to be yeah. honest, I've never really used tactics in any other language. Um, I, I did a little okay. bit of lean. I was telling Farhad just before the talk of I've done like I was trying to prove some things about natural numbers um, in lean just to get a feel for it. And so really, the only tactic language I've seen is is lean. Um, I chose lean partly because it was the only thing I was familiar with, but also um, behind behind all this stuff is built uh, is Reed's library refinery, which um, build sort of a tactics monad. And so all of the internal stuff is built in terms of that. And it would be really lovely to be able to expose that. Um, but there's sort of two challenges, right? One one challenge is I would love to just expose Haskell code for this. Um, and you can do that today if you're willing to submit a pull request. But again, it's sort of hard to evaluate um, Haskell code at runtime. And so I could have written a little language that looked a lot like Haskell. Um, but then I think everyone would be frustrated that it wasn't Haskell, right? If it looked like Haskell and usually was Haskell, but didn't support the usual ADMs or didn't have all the prelude functions or something. Um, and so it's sort of, I guess part of the inspiration here is I sort of intentionally chose a bad representation of tactics in order to not give anyone um, the dream that like it's more than it is. Um, I'm not. I'm not like married to this idea, and I'm happy to change it. And as it exists today, you know, there's really no problem in changing it because nothing can depend on this except our brains, right? Um, if there's no abstraction capabilities, then it doesn't matter if the interface changes. So, um, so I, I'd love to have a solution to this. I don't have one, but uh, today it's based on Lean. Cool. Thank you very much, Sandy. I, I think those were the questions that were on there. Um, again, great talk. Uh, this is great stuff. I, I, I'm so really much. impressed. And cheers. Uh, yeah, oh, cheers. See you later. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Hey, Jiriak, and we're in the end of the uh, We have one more activity coming up, but um, yeah. quickly, that's better. Um, so yeah, we have one last uh, track coming up, EHP, after this.
Um, but uh, we'll already give our closing remarks in this stream. So first of all, from all of us, uh, we want to thank our partners that uh, this year have given us uh, interesting talks, have given us some support, have given us uh, lessons. Um, and we hope to uh, work together with them again next year. Uh, Jasper? Um, so yeah, we had a really good amount of people this year. We had over 900 registrations um, and almost 1,400 people in the Discord server. So thank you all for attending. And I hope you really enjoyed the event, even though you maybe only attended a couple of talks or something like that. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, one maybe piece of useful information is that uh, our talks have been recorded. So everything that has been streamed over YouTube, you can already find on our channel. And as for some of the company presentations and the tracks, some of them are already uploaded and uh, for some others we are working on it. So um, I think you're capable of uh, Googling for our YouTube channel and finding it. So, and we have been getting already some like nice feedback on, uh, on Reddit and other places. So I think we have about three times the amount of people that watched the talks uh, outside of Zurihack than during Zurihack. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Although the last two online Zuri hacks were good, I guess everyone would like to return to a physical event as soon as possible. So for 2022, we are currently trying for a physical event at the Austin Rappersville. Uh, for those of you who want to, you may tentatively mark the 17th, 18th, and 19th of June for Zuri hack 2022 in person at Austin the Rappersville. Let's see how it goes. So thank you all for coming to Zurihack. And um, in addition to Zurihack, there are two other events I wanted to call out. Um, so the first of those is Haskell.love, which takes place uh, September 10. It's a relatively new um, Haskell online conference. They had the first edition last year, and there were a lot of interesting talks. I think you can even still submit a talk um, for this year. Um, and the website for that is Haskell.love. The second event I want to advertise is the ICFP contest this year. Um, because in addition to Zurihack, I'm also organizing this event this year. And so the ICFP contest is a programming contest associated with the ICFP conference. Uh, this year it takes place from 9, uh, 9th of July to 12th of July. It runs for 72 hours. You can join for free with your friends or your colleagues, um, a team of any size, fully online. One remark is that it's um, historically it hasn't been an easy contest to win. There are a lot of teams that have been doing this for years, and winners have included some very well-known computer scientists. But we did put some effort into making it very approachable this year. So I think you will have a lot of fun, even if you um, sort of approach it in a more casual way. Good. So um, since it's getting quite late for many people in some parts of the world, or very early for some people in some parts of the world, we'd like to take this opportunity to just say bye-bye from, from us as the organizers. But yeah, for those of you who can, there's still the IHP track that's still going on. So at least from us for the moment, uh, we look forward to seeing you again for the next Zuri Hack in 2022, hopefully physically in Rappersville in person. Thanks.